have to go back to the main village. I don't know why. So he said, no, no, don't go, don't go, don't go. I said, no, I'm going to go. They said, well, look, we're not going to go with you. It's too late. It's too dark. I said, don't worry about me. I'll get myself back. So I walked back along the edge of a, a ravine that fell to the sea about 300 feet below. I didn't know how much earth there was under my feet. But the next day, my guide, Dominico, came running to me. And he said, do you have any idea what you walked on at night? I said, no, I walked on the path along the edge of the bluff back to the main village. And he said, yes, but let me take you back there so you can see with your own eyes how close you came to falling to your death. And we walked back, and there was less than an inch of earth on that ridge between my foot and the sea, the pounding sea below. I have no idea what drove me to walk back to the village, nor do I know whether there was an angel who put her hand underneath my foot. All I'm saying to you is that wasn't the first time uh, that something of that nature had occurred in my life. And I'm sure everyone listening to this show has experienced near misses and said, holy God, what was that about? You know, and you, you change your life for a little bit after that. Once when I was nine years old playing with my cousin, Sam, in front of his house in Jamaica, Queens, I don't remember the street, a car hit me. We were playing ball in the street, back and forth, back and forth, and a car just banged into me on the side. He wasn't speeding, but it hit me. I got knocked down. I was dazed. To this day, I fantasize that I was actually killed that day, and all the rest of this is a dream. Can you imagine that this whole radio show is a dream and that you're not real? That I'm not real, that this is all imaginary, that's impossible. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't think I'm the only one who's had that experience and that kind of, tran let's say, transition to thinking, is this really a dream? Because we are spiritual creatures. And I don't want to get too preachy, but I, I will get mildly preachy. I think that when I talk about family values, when I talk about borders, language, and culture, do you understand what I'm saying to you, which is that without a soul there is no nation? A nation has to be more than a nation simply of income, income distribution, taxation, taxes, money, business. That's all well and good. A nation needs that to be healthy economically. But, you know, as I said, Jesus wrote, what does it profit if the man who gaineth the world and loseth his soul? And America has lost its soul. That's what I've been trying to scream to you about. Just as a man can lose his soul, a nation can lose its soul. I want to shift, though, to something entirely different. We're living in interesting times. We have no authority figures to believe in. We have no government to believe in. That's why I wrote Government Zero. And I made a commitment, which I should repeat right now. All of the royalties that I make on that book will be given to my Savage Scholarship Fund for deserving college students going forward. That will be one of the things I leave as my legacy after my radio career. Savage. I'm going to talk about a dream I had about a dinner I had with Barack Obama. I was in a broken pickup truck with Barack Obama. I said, Mr. Obama, would you like to have a meal with me and sit down and talk about the differences that we have? I said, you grew up in Hawaii. I lived there for a while. You like Chinese food. How about clearing the air with me, Michael Savage? To end the hatred and the mistrust in this country that is infecting the air of America itself, no cameras, no makeup, just Michael Savage and Barack Obama sharing Hunan dishes. Why don't we just sit down and talk about what's plaguing America? And I wrote down these questions Sunday morning. Question one, Mr. Obama, why did you insist on pushing into the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Justice Department a lawyer who defended the assassin of a police officer, a lawyer who has such a hatred for the police and law enforcement that he called them an occupying fascist presence? Over pork dumplings, Mr. Obama, why did you just sign an executive order making it possible for foreigners with terror ties to become citizens? Mr. Obama, over fresh sautéed squid, why did you refuse to send military help to the people trapped in Benghazi? Mr. Obama, why do you attack Israel and have John Kerry threaten the Jewish people with another intifada and boycotts unless they give away half their nation? And now that we're up to the country-style smoked ham, either hot or mild, Mr. Obama, number five, why have you fired so many combat generals on such slim charges at a time when China is on the march and the Islamo-fascists are stronger than ever? Number six, Mr. Obama, boy, this, boy, this Hunan orange sauce chicken is good, don't you say? Mr. Obama, why have you dismissed almost the entire nuclear command structure on trumped-up charges? 
Number seven, why do you keep expanding the welfare state when the economy is so weak, such as expanding unemployment payments, not reining in the 12 million and growing army of Americans cashing in on disability payments, Mr. Obama? Number eight, boy, this rice is nice. They do make it for us, you know, fresh. Number eight, Mr. Obama, why do you keep pushing for amnesty for 30 or more million illegal aliens, mainly Mexicans and other illegal aliens, when they're here illegally? And we cannot afford them when they won't learn English or our history, when they want Mexican flags at sporting events and speak of the gringo with such contempt. Mr. Obama, it doesn't make sense. Even the Swiss just voted to curtail immigration, saying it was destroying the Swiss culture. It can't be that many Republicans who have left America and have now voted in the Swiss elections. Can it be, Mr. Obama? Number nine, Mr. Obama, why won't you stop the IRS from targeting conservative groups, harassing them with audits and blocking their nonprofit status. Do you like the spicy shrimp with bean curd, Mr. Obama? It tastes very good. Here's question 10, Mr. Obama. Why won't you stop the NSA from spying on innocent Americans? Again, if you're listening to the Savage Nation, these are questions uh, that O'Reilly didn't ask in his interview. And I had a dream that... Mr. Obama agreed to have Chinese food with me, and it's sort of an invitation to Mr. Obama to put aside the enmity and the hatred in this country. There's no better way than to meet a conservative member of the opposition party. Because I, Michael Savage, am not a politician. I've never been a politician. I've never been a lawyer. I don't intend to be a lawyer. I don't intend to be a politician. I am an American, and I have questions. So, Mr. Obama, again, I address another question to you. Why won't you prosecute gangsters on Wall Street and those corrupt senators and congressmen who are stealing billions of dollars through front groups and their relatives with fraudulent federal contracts, Mr. Obama? Number 12. Boy, this garlic chicken is very good. It beats Safeway. Why won't you approve the Keystone Pipeline, which will bring much-needed oil from Canada to refineries in America. For Americans, Mr. Obama, it makes common sense. Instead of forcing the Canadians to ship this precious black gold to China. Mr. Obama, question number 13. You closed the World War II memorial during the government shutdown, while at the same time you granted thousands of illegal aliens the right to the Capitol Mall to protest existing immigration laws. Can you explain to all of the veterans who hang on my every word what you were thinking, Mr. Obama? Savage. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. Now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation. Talk radio for the thinking person, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. Have a holly, jolly Christmas. And when you. You know, many people can't listen to talk radio anymore because although they know that we are truth sayers, they're frightened. They know the government is filled with lying, deceitful. Uh, we, we don't even have words for this government of ours. Many of you have words, but we're not going to use them here, because then I'll go into the hate that I'm trying to avoid, the rage, the anger, the righteous indignation. I, I've got to stay away from it. It makes you too brittle. It doesn't leave you flexible enough to fight them. And what's coming over the next year that's left of this monster is unimaginable. You think you've seen it all, you're mistaken, because I know what they do in the last three months. It's the, the sin qua non of everything that they've done before that magnified by three. What Bush did to us in the last three months of his reign was unimaginable. I was the only one in radio who saw it coming. I called him a, what did I call him, a socialist or something like, a fiscal socialist. It was August of the last year of Bush's reign. I had always been a little queasy about him. I never liked him. I thought he was a double talker. I thought he was part of the deceitful establishment. It was proven when all the talk show hosts who were conservative were invited to 
lunch with him except me. That was okay. I accepted that. <laughs> I'm used to it as an independent, not Republican. I, I, would, I, I accepted that. didn't matter. Now, what happened was, as I said, he's a fiscal socialist lookout, and he busted the economy out in the last three months, as you well know, and gave us Obama as a result. And they created Obama. Make no mistake about it. The Republicans wanted Obama. They carried the football of the seat for eight straight years, and they knew they couldn't carry it for another four. So they gave you Obama for another eight, figuring they'll play the game back and forth to two-card Monty. See? So now we've had a Democrat for eight years. It's time for Republican. And they're shocked that it may be an independent nationalist like Trump. And they're doing everything they can to shaft the American people. But I want to talk about what I talked about. And so I stand again. I'll go back to what I said to you before. I want to go in another direction. You can inspire in other ways. You can inspire through love, hope, and humor. Now you say, Mike, you know, that's all well and good, but we're facing a Muslim enemy. And I know the rest of the story. I can give you the whole, the whole paragraph, the chapter, and the verse. I've written about it. I've talked about it. Almost everything that Donald Trump says I agree with because it's all in my last two books. I'm not accusing him of plagiarism. Don't get me wrong. Trust me, if this is what you do in your spare time is write books instead of giving speeches, and then you hear the words that you say being spoken by others, what can you say? You say, thank God for the printed and spoken word. I posted a, a message on my Facebook page, given that I'm being censored on Facebook. I, will, I hope you will find it inspirational. And I intend to go down that road for a bit. And 4,443 people were reached since I posted it. I showed an article where the ACLU threatens to kill and tells people to kill Trump supporters. And Zuckerberg has not taken down that post. 9,000 people reached. That kind of tells you everything. And it puts what I'm about to say in a new context. And here's what I wrote. I just read it straight out. My voice and my ability to move crowds is my gift, but also my burden. This power of the magical voice which I first discovered in the first grade in a slum school in the Bronx can change people's fates. It's a great gift and a great burden. How would you use this power if you were me as a broadcaster and best-selling author from this day forward? I intend to make this day forward the first day of the rest of my life, as was said in the hippie 70s and 60s. We can change our lives. You say, well, what's wrong with your life, Michael? Well, it's not that there's anything wrong with my life, but it's not what I want it to be. I don't feel that I'm inspiring people in the way I want to inspire them. You see, you can inspire through hate, as ISIS does, as the ACLU does, even as Hillary and Obama do in their own quasi-moderate ways. They inspire through hate. You can inspire through anger. You can inspire through rage. You can inspire through false righteous indignation. We, we know that operates. We get it every day of the week, mainly on talk radio. In varieties, that's what you get. Anger, rage, false righteous indignation. And it riles you up and you listen. That's an inspiration. But then there's the bigger inspirations. You can inspire through love, Hope, humor, the positives. I know it sounds hippy-dippy, 60s. I look at the history of the world, and I look at the world today, and I realize that if we don't inspire each other through positive attributes, love, hope, and humor, we're going to descend into the barbarism of the left and the barbarism of ISIS. Now, maybe this is a different turn for Michael Savage. I get it. You like me to be hard. You like me to be tough. You like me to give you the breaking news. You like me to be cynical. You like me to be analytical. You like me to give you stuff that you don't hear anywhere else. I get that. But there's a limit to that. There's a limit to, the, to that. Believe it or not, that's all limited. There's a lot of area beyond all of that. That's called space, time, and the universe, and I want to go there. I want to go there in this life with you, and I want to inspire you in the most positive manner. So I'm asking you a simple question. If you were me, if you had the power that I have for as long as I still may have it, and God only knows how long I'll have this power, 
as a broadcaster, as a best-selling author. How would you inspire people on this 